Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, once again we thank you that we can gather in your presence to open your holy word and to understand the great things that have taken place, are taking place, and soon will occur in this world. As we study Daniel chapter 8 today, we need the special guidance of your Holy Spirit. We ask, Father, that you will give us understanding, that we might be able to comprehend this magnificent chapter of Scripture. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to see its importance for our own personal walk with Jesus. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin by reviewing what we've studied in our last two lectures. Basically, I want to go through the sequence of powers that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. The first power, and we'll go to Daniel 7 as our example, the first power is a lion. Represents what kingdom? Babylon. The next kingdom is what? Medo-Persia. The third kingdom, the leopard kingdom, is what? Greece. Then we have a terrible dragon beast that has iron teeth. And what nation does that represent? It represents the Roman Empire. Then from the head of that dragon beast come forth what? Ten horns. And those represent the divisions of the Roman Empire into which the Roman Empire was divided when it broke up in the year 476. And then among the ten rises what? A little horn, a nasty little horn and does all kinds of wicked things. And it rules for how long? It rules for 1,260 years, and that period begins when? In the year 538, when the Ostrogoths were defeated. The third of the three horns was ripped out by the roots. And it continued until what date? The little horn, 1798. And then you notice that we have the next scene is what? The judgment. So after what date does the judgment take place? It has to be after 1798. But it also happens before probation closes, before Jesus comes. Because we notice in Revelation, Chapter 14, it says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come while the gospel is still being preached. Probation can't have closed if the gospel is still being preached. And only after the third angel's message do you have Jesus sitting on a cloud with a sickle coming to harvest the earth. And so we noticed in our study that the judgment takes place sometime between 1798 and the close of probation. Although we are not told exactly what the precise date is. All we have is the parameters. But the prophecy that we're going to study in this evening's lecture, as well as our next one, regarding Daniel chapter 8, we're going to notice that Scripture pinpoints the exact date when that judgment was going to begin. So let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. And the first thing that we're going to notice in this chapter is that it does not begin with Babylon like chapter 7 and like chapter 2. There is no symbol for Babylon. In fact, in Daniel chapter 8, the vision begins with Medo-Persia. Now, you might be wondering, Pastor Bohr, why does the vision of Daniel 8 begin with Medo-Persia if Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 began with Babylon? 
Now, the traditional interpretation that has been given in the Adventist church is that Babylon is about to pass from history. But the fact is that this vision is taking place in the year 550 B.C., and Babylon was not going to fall for another 11 years. There is another more important reason why Babylon is not in this vision of Daniel chapter 8. And let me explain the reason succinctly. You see... The 2300 days that are mentioned in this prophecy begin during the period of the Persian Empire. And so the vision begins, now listen carefully, the vision begins where the 2300 days begin. You see, the 2300 days do not begin in the kingdom of Babylon. They begin during the period of the kingdom of Persia. And therefore... The 2300-day prophecy begins with Persia, and that's the reason why this vision begins with Persia and not with Babylon. Are you understanding the reason? It's a very important reason, and we will have reason to come back to this a little bit later. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 1 and move through this uh, magnificent prophecy. It says there in verse 1, In the third year... Of, his reign, of the reign of King Belshazzar, I mentioned that this is the year 550 B.C., it says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. Which is the one that appeared to him the first time? The one that is found in the previous chapter, in Daniel chapter what? Chapter 7. Now, listen carefully. The word for vision here is a very important word. You see, in Daniel 8, there are two different words for vision. And unless we understand that, we're not going to reach correct conclusions as we study this chapter. The word that is used here for vision, where it says, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, is the Hebrew word shazon. Remember that because it's very, very important. Now let's go to verse 2. I saw in the vision, once again, the word chazon. I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, notice the emphasis on eyesight here, that I was in Shushan, which is one of the capitals of the Medo-Persian Empire, the citadel, which is the capital, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, once again, the third time that the word chazon is used to describe the vision. So it says in verse 2, I saw in the vision chazon, and it so happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, vision that is chazon, that I was by the river Ulai. Now let's go to verse 3. Then I lifted my eyes and saw. Notice once again the emphasis on, on vision, seeing. There's tremendous emphasis on this. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a what? A ram. Just one beast. But now notice what it continues saying, which had two what? Two horns. So this is one nation that is composed of two kingdoms. Because horns represent kingdoms. So it's one nation composed of two kingdoms. In other words, dual kingdoms in one nation. So it continues saying, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one, what? Came up last. So you have two horns, one is higher than the other, and the higher one comes out how? Last. Now, you should have received two sheets tonight. One of the sheets has the dynasty of the Medes and Persians. Now, if you look at that chart, we're not going to look at it carefully right now because we don't have the time. From the year 539, when the Medes and Persians began to rule, till the year 522, all of the kings were Medes, except for Cyrus, who was half Mede and half Persian. But from the year 522 till the year 331, almost 200 years, every single king 
was Persian. So what was the nation that became more powerful last? It was the Persians. And interestingly enough, after Daniel chapter 8, every time that this kingdom appears in prophecy, it's no longer called Medo-Persia, it is called Persia. Because the Medes have basically disappeared and now Persia is ruling. Are you understanding my point? And you can see it on that chart. Prophecy is specific and exact on this point. Now, this battle that we're going to see here at the beginning of Daniel chapter 8 is taking place on a horizontal level on earth. There is no indication that these nations are in controversy or in conflict with God. This is a geographical fight among nations on a horizontal level. There's no fight against God in the early part of the chapter. Notice Daniel chapter 8 and verse 4. Oh, by the way, do you remember that the bear was raised up on one side? Huh, in Daniel chapter 7. And here we have one horn that's what? That's higher than the other. See, it's parallel. Now Daniel chapter 8 and verse 4. I saw the ram, which represents the Medes and Persians, pushing westward, northward, and southward. How many ribs did the bear have in its mouth in Daniel 7? Three. And here the ram conquers in three directions. Westward would be Babylon, 539. Northward would be Lydia, 546. And southward would be Egypt in the year 525. And it continues saying, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. Now remember that. The ram became what? The ram became great. That's important. Now, we have another power that rises. Go with me to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 5. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west. It's interesting. A male goat came from the west. Do you know that Greece is west of Persia? And do you know that Daniel was in Persia when he received this vision? And so he sees this beast coming from the west. What nation does this beast represent, this he goat? Greece. Interesting. Even the points of the compass are precise and exact. And so it says, and as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without what? Without touching the ground. What beast represented Greece in Daniel chapter 7? A leopard. Is a leopard swift? Yes, but the leopard had what? Four wings of a bird, super swift. Here the he-goat, which represents the same power, is so swift that it's flying. Have you ever seen a flying goat? Oh my, he is really conquering in a hurry. And by the way, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the prophecy tells us that Alexander the Great who is represented by a notable horn. In fact, let's read it, and then I'll tell you something about Alexander the Great. It says that this he-goat came without touching the ground, and the goat had a what? A notable horn between his eyes, which later on in chapter 8 says that it represents the first king of this nation, which is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great moved from Athens all the way to to the Indus Valley, In three years, he conquered the known world. And uh, he died when he was only 33 years old of a drunken binge because he didn't have anything more to do. He didn't have anything more to conquer. Amazing. He was swift. Notice Daniel chapter 8 and verses 6 and 7. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Is this battle still taking place horizontally on earth? Is this an earthly battle? Any indication that the, that, uh, the uh, he-goat has any bone to pick with the Lord? Absolutely not. This is a geographical fight among nations on a horizontal level. 
Now let's notice Daniel chapter 8 and verse 8. Therefore the male goat grew, what? Very great. Ah, the, the, the ram grew what? Great. Now we see that the he goat grows what? Very great. Don't forget that because we're going to come back to it. Therefore the male goat, which represents Greece, grew very great, but when he became strong, in other words, at the climax of his strength, what happened? The large horn was broken. Alexander the Great died when Greece was at the apex of its power in a drunken binge, like I mentioned. And notice what happened. It continues saying, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. How many heads did the leopard have? The leopard had four heads. Now, how many, uh, how many horns come when this great horn is broken? Four. So we, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 are parallel prophecies. Now, you need to understand what happened after Alexander the Great died. After he died, there was a struggle among his generals to gain power in the kingdom. And for a while, sometimes there were three kingdoms, sometimes there were four kingdoms, sometimes there were even two kingdoms. But finally, four kingdoms emerged from what had been Alexander's empire. I want to read you a statement that is found in the book by W. W. Tarn, Hellenistic Civilization, page 6, where he explains these four kingdoms. He says this, by 275, three dynasties descended from three of his generals, and they were well established. The Seleucids, which by the way ruled from 312 to the year 63 BC, he says, the Seleucids ruled much of what had been the Persian Empire in Asia. The Ptolemies, who ruled from 323 to 30 BC, ruled Egypt. And the Antigonids, who ruled from 283 to 168, ruled Macedonia. And then he says this, a fourth European dynasty, not connected with Alexander, the Attalids of Pergamum, 263 to 133, subsequently, subsequently grew up in Asia Minor at Seleucid expense and became great by the favor of Rome. So the four kingdoms that arose, four stable kingdoms that lasted a significant period of time were the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, the Antigonids, and the Attalids in Pergamum. Now, I, I want to just mention that many scholars, probably most Roman Catholic scholars and Protestant scholars, believe that the little horn that is going to come from these four uh, horns at the four winds represents a nasty individual called Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a Syrian ruler that ruled from the year 171 till the year 163 B.C. I want to tell you that I do not share the idea that this little horn of Daniel 8 that comes forth from the four horns represents Antiochus Epiphanes because there are too many parallels between the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and the little horn of Daniel 8 that indicate that this represents the same power. Let me just mention some of those par parallels. First of all, both are referred to as a horn. And even though Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 are in two different languages, Daniel 7 is in Aramaic and Daniel chapter 8 is in Hebrew, the same Hebrew word, karen, is used to describe the horn, the identical word for the horn of Daniel 7 and the horn of Daniel 8. Secondly, both are described as little. In the third place, both of them become great after they had a small beginning. In the fourth place, both are described as persecuting powers. In the fifth place, the persecution is against the same target group, that is, against the people of the saints of the Most High. In the sixth place, both of them are self-exalting and blasphemous powers. In the seventh place, both are distinguished by crafty intelligence, 
One has the eyes of a man in Daniel chapter 7, and in Daniel chapter 8, the little horn understands riddles and cunning and deceit. Number eight, both of these represent the final power that will rule upon this earth. Number nine, both of these horns have to do with prophetic time. Number 10, both of these horns extend until the time of the end. And number 11, both of the horns are supernaturally destroyed when Jesus comes. In other words, the little horn of Daniel 8 represents the same power as the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. I want to read a statement by a, an individual who was my teacher at the seminary in Michigan, Andrews University, William Shea, a tremendous Old Testament scholar. In the book Symposium on Daniel, page 187, this is what he says. If the prophet, that is if Daniel, had desired to represent different powers in this final position, he could easily have used different symbols to do so. But instead, he used the same symbol of a little horn at the end of the vision in chapter 8, as he did at the end of the vision in chapter 7. This commonality of representation suggests that the same symbol has been used to refer to the same power in both cases. So in other words, the little horn of Daniel 7 and the little horn of Daniel 8 represents basically the same power. Now, there's a problem. In Daniel chapter 7, the little horn rises from the head of the fourth beast. In Daniel chapter 8, the little horn rises from one of the four horns that were a part of Alexander the Great's broken up empire. So you say it gives the impression that in Daniel chapter 7, this little horn comes from Rome, but in Daniel chapter 8, this little horn comes from one of the four divisions of the empire of Greece, the empire of Alexander the Great. Well, this problem is not as uh, difficult as some people would believe. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9. It says here, And out of one of them, that is, out of one of the four horns at the four winds, came a what? A little horn, now listen carefully, which grew what? Exceedingly great. Is there a progression here? The ram was what? Great. The he goat was what? Very great. And the little horn is exceeding great. That's why I don't believe that this little horn can be Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes was a non-entity non in history. He wasn't greater than the Medes and Persians and the Greeks. There are other reasons why this little horn is not Antiochus Epiphanes. And so notice what it continues saying. And out of one of them, and it, out of the one, one of the four horns to the four winds, came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the east, that is, towards Greece, Asia Minor, and Syria, and toward the south, that's Egypt, and toward the glorious land, that is Israel. Now listen carefully. There's one kingdom that conquered in those three directions to rise to power. And that nation was what? Rome. If you look at history, you'll find that Rome conquered the south, Egypt. It conquered towards the east, Greece, Asia Minor, and Syria, where the previous power had ruled, and the glorious land, which is what? The land of Israel. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to say. In Daniel chapter 8, the little horn represents both pagan Rome and papal Rome. And you'll notice as we study this prophecy that the little horn at first conquers only horizontally and geographically. But suddenly, that little horn that is only conquering, according to this, where? The south, the east, and the glorious land, suddenly he shifts. And now he's fighting against whom? He's fighting against the God of heaven. Is this true of what happened in Daniel 7 with Rome? The iron monarchy of Rome conquered how? Horizontally. But then suddenly the little horn, which is also Rome, now does what? 
it speaks blasphemies against the Most High, and it persecutes the saints of the Most High, and it thinks it can change the law of the Most High. Now you say, why is this little horn portrayed as coming from one of the four kingdoms that uh, came from the kingdom of Alexander the Great? Let me tell you why. The reason why is because historians such as Virgil, you ever heard of Virgil? Seneca, and other historians of Rome make it very clear that Roman religion and Roman civilization and Roman culture had their origins in Asia Minor, specifically in Pergamum. And that was one of the kingdoms into which the kingdom of Alexander the Great was divided. In other words, it is strictly true that the Roman Empire grew out of Asia Minor. It grew out of the kingdom of Pergamum, which was one of the four kingdoms that were formed after the fall of Alexander the Great. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 10. By the way, if you're interested in studying this more extensively, I wrote a document, it's about 30 pages long, on uh, the whole message of Daniel chapter 8, and it has a lot more material than what I'm able to present here tonight and in our next lecture. So if you really want to get into an in-depth study of these things, I have quotations from historians and so on showing that Roman civilization, religion, culture arose from one of those kingdoms of Greece. Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 10. Suddenly, this little horn, who is only concerned with co conquering geographically and horizontally, suddenly, like the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, it starts fighting against the God of heaven. Now his fight becomes vertical. Notice Daniel chapter 8 and verse 10. It says, And it grew up to the what? To the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled on them. Now the question is, what is represented by the host or by these stars? You know, we might be tempted to think that they were angels, but somehow I don't think that... Uh, the little horn was able to grab the angels and throw them to the ground and trample on them. In fact, the Bible uses the word host not only to, to describe the heavenly hosts of God, but to describe his earthly people, his earthly army, because in Scripture, the church is described as what? As an army. Let me prove that. Go with me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 45. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 45. This is speaking about the time that David met Goliath. And it says there, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the what? Of the Lord of hosts. And now notice who the hosts are. The Lord of hosts, the God of the what? of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. So what is the host? The armies of what? The armies of Israel. So what is this little horn doing? Who is he casting down? In Daniel 7, it says that the little horn would persecute the saints of the Most High. So here the stars, or God's host, represents what? It represents God's people. Later on in the chapter, we're going to find this very clearly expressed. And so the first thing that this, that this little horn does is the same thing as the little horn of Daniel 7. He persecutes the saints and he throws them to the ground and he tramples them. But then you'll notice in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11 that he goes even further. It says in Daniel 8, 11, he even exalted himself as high as whom? As the prince of the host. The leader of the host, in other words. And by him, that is by the little horn, the daily sacrifices, you need to delete that word sacrifices because it is not, it is not in the Hebrew. It's only the word daily. It said, and we'll come to that in a minute. And by him, that is by the little horn, the daily was what? Was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was what? The place of his sanctuary was cast down. Interesting. Now the question is, who is this prince of the host? 
Well, this identical expression is used only in one other place in the whole Bible. The prince of the host. It's not translated the same, but it's the identical expression. Joshua chapter 5 and verses 13 through 15. Joshua chapter 5 and verses 13 through 15. Let's find out who this prince of the host is, from whom the daily is taken away and the sanctuary is cast down. Notice Joshua 5 verse 13. This is outside of the city of Jericho. We read this once before. And uh, Joshua meets this man with a sword in his hand. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. That expression, commander of the army of the Lord, is the identical expression, prince of the host. It's not translated the same, but in Hebrew, it's identical. And so he says, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua, what did Joshua do? Ooh, it says he fell on his face to earth and what? Was this a common ordinary man? Ah, uh -uh, this was Jesus. And said to him, what does my Lord? say to his servant. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. Who was that prince of the host? It's none other than Jesus Christ. So what does the little horn do? He even attacks the prince of the host, Jesus Christ, and he takes away from Jesus what? The daily and he cast the sanctuary to the ground. Now you say, what is meant by that? The daily. As I mentioned, the word sacrifice is not there. It's added by the translators, but it is nowhere to be found in the original Hebrew. You see, the translators, they felt that this little horn represented Antiochus Epiphanes, and Antiochus Epiphanes uh, eliminated the sacrifices in the temple for three years. So because they're thinking Antiochus Epiphanes, they're translating daily sacrifices. The fact is that the word daily here is an adjective that has no noun to qualify. The word simply means something that goes on and on and on without interruption. In other words, it's a technical term. It should be understood not as an adjective, although technically it is, it should be understood as a noun. And of course the question is, he took away the daily what? Well, it must have something to do with the sanctuary, right? Because the whole theme of Daniel chapter 8 is a sanctuary, correct? Even the two animals that you find in Daniel chapter 8 are the two most important animals of the sanctuary. The daily service, morning and evening, a ram was sacrificed. And the yearly service, a he goat was sacrificed. So God is saying by choosing these two beasts, the central theme of Daniel 7 is what? The sanctuary. So the question is, the little horn took away, away the daily. The question is, the daily what? Well, we need to look at the answer in the sanctuary. Is that word used in connection with the sanctuary? It most certainly is. Now allow me to tell you that this word is used in connection with the ministry of the priest in the court and in the holy place of the sanctuary. It's never used to refer to anything that the priest does in the most holy place. It's used to refer to what he did in the court and in the holy place of the sanctuary. Let me mention uh, several verses where this very word, tamid, is used. Exodus 28 and verse 30, and we're going to go quickly. Exodus 28 and verse 30. The high priest who ministered in the holy place, the Bible says that he ministered continually. Notice what it says there. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. We read this once before. And they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord. What? continually. That's the word tamid. Notice the similar language in Hebrews 7, 23 to 25, where it talks about Jesus. Hebrews 7, verses 23 through 25. Speaking about the old system, it says, and there were many priests, 
because they were prevented by death from continuing. See that word continuing? They couldn't continue because they what? Because they died. But now notice, but he, because he what? Ah, he continues forever, has a what? An unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he what? Always lives to make intercession for them. Is the intercession of Jesus Christ continual? Is it tamid? See, it really shouldn't even be translated daily. It should be translated continual. Notice Exodus chapter 29 and verse 42. The sacrifices that were offered morning and evening are also referred to by the word tamid, continual. It says, this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord where I will meet you to speak with you. Notice, the offering was what? The continual burnt offering. The fire that was used to burn the sacrifices was also a continual fire. Notice Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 13. It says, and fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. In other words, it was to be burning continually. The table of showbread the bread on the table is called the continual bread. Notice Exodus chapter 25 and verse 30. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 30. And you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. It's translated always, but it's the word tamid. It could be translated, you shall set the showbread on the table before me continually. Notice also that the seven lamps of the holy place are called the continual lamps. Leviticus chapter 24 and verses 1 through 4. Leviticus chapter 24 and verses 1 through 4. It says here, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light, to make the seven lamps burn what? There's the word, continually. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting. Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually, there's the word again, it shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall be in charge of the lamps on the, of the pure gold lampstand before the Lord, continually. Once again, the same word. So the continual refers to the sacrifice, to the ministration of the priest in the holy place, to the fire that was offered in the court. It refers to the showbread. It refers to the seven lamps. It also refers to the golden altar of incense in the holy place. Notice Exodus chapter 30 and verse 8. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 8. It says, And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it. A what? Well, the translation says a perpetual incense. It's the same identical word. It could be a continual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Now let me ask you, what did the altar and the lampstand, and the showbread, and the priest, and the altar of incense represent. They represented different aspects of the saving ministry of whom? Of the saving ministry of Jesus Christ. Now notice the place of the sanctuary was going to be what? Cast down to the earth. Where does Jesus minister? He ministers in the heavenly sanctuary. What was the little horn going to do? The little horn was going to take the heavenly ministry of Christ and he was going to cast it where? To the earth. He was going to establish a rival earthly ministry in place of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, how many times does Jesus have to die? The book of Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27 says that he dies once for all. But in the Roman Catholic Church, they teach that at every Mass, Jesus Christ is sacrificed once again. Interesting. But there's more. They believe that in the little wafer host, Jesus is contained in each one of those wafer hosts. If there's 10 million people participating in the host, Christ is fully and complete in each one of them. Furthermore, the interesting thing is that this little host is what shape? Round. And what color is it? It's yellow. What is round and yellow? The sun. Now listen carefully. 
the host is kept in an artifact that is called the tabernacle. In other words, it's a little circle and the host is placed inside. And you know, outside the place where you put the host, there are the rays of the sun sprouting out. I don't know whether you've ever seen that in the Roman Catholic Church, but it's very interesting. And Catholics are told that when the host is raised up, they are to bow and they are to what? They are to worship the host because Jesus is in the host. Furthermore, listen to what I'm going to say. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that when the priest pronounces those words, hoc est corpus meum, that is my body. He says it in Latin in the traditional way. What he does is he creates Jesus Christ really and truly in the host. And the host is no longer bread, even though it appears like bread. The appearance doesn't change, but it is the real body of Jesus Christ. And the grape juice or the wine that the priest drinks is the real blood of Jesus Christ, even though it tastes like grape juice. So where is the focus of people in Roman Catholicism? Is it upon the body and blood of Jesus Christ uh, in heaven who died once for all for us? No, it is focused where? It is focused on earth. And an earthly system cannot save. This is very, very serious. In fact, do you know that one Roman Catholic theologian said that the priest could be called the creator of his creator because he creates Jesus in the host. Amazing. What does the candlestick represent? We already studied this. What does the candlestick represent? It represents the oil of the Holy Spirit that gives, that is given to the church so that the church can give what? So it can give light. What happened during the period of the dominion of the little horn? The light flickered. That's why it's called what kind of ages? It's called the dark ages. Because the church no longer preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is spoken of as light in scripture. In other words, it it affected the mission and the message of the church. What about the showbread? What does the showbread represent? The showbread represents the word of God. Twelve loaves because there's enough to feed all of Israel, all of God's people. What did the Roman Catholic Church establish in place of the word of God? Tradition. All kinds of traditions came into the church. Purgatory, limbo, celibacy, auricular confession, an eternally burning hell, Lent, processions, the mass, relics, canonization of saints, the rosary, bowing before images, the immaculate conception, the assumption of Mary, the baptism of in infants by sprinkling, novenas, the observance of Sunday. I could continue the list. None of which are taught in Holy Scripture. In other words, instead of the word of God, being the rule of the church. The result was that the church established tradition and therefore people were starving to death on earth. By the way, at the Council of Toulouse in the year 1229, the Roman Catholic Church officially forbade lay people from reading the scriptures. And there were other decrees by other councils where people were forbidden from reading the Bible. That's the reason why Martin Luther even when he was a monk and he discovered a Bible, he was surprised. Because the Bible was not accessible. It was in Latin. In fact, people like Wycliffe, you know, when he translated the Bible into English, they burned him at the stake for translating the Bible into a language that people could understand. And so the Roman Catholic Church substituted, instead of the bread, it substituted tradition. Let me ask you, what does the altar of incense represent? The altar of incense represents that when we pray, our prayers are blended with the perfect merits of Christ's righteousness and we are accepted in the sight of God. Question, what did the Roman Catholic Church establish in place of the only intercession of Christ? We have one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ the man, Scripture says. What does the Roman Catholic Church teach? They say that we are supposed to confess to whom? We are supposed to confess our sins to a priest, an earthly priest. And not only that, they say that if we want access to Jesus Christ, we have to go through the Virgin Mary. And we have to go through the saints. Do you know why they teach that? 
even though they would never admit it because in their theological formulations they don't say this, but in practical reality, it's this way. You see, Jesus is seen by Roman Catholics as a stern judge. See, he was, he was human, but he really wasn't exactly like one of us. So we have to go through someone who can really understand us, like Mary and like the saints. And so what do we have happening here? All of the functions that belong to Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, what did the papacy do? What did the little horn do? It took all of those functions and it placed them where? And it placed them on earth. Let me ask you, is salvation at stake here? It most certainly is. Are you understanding what the taking away of the daily is? It's, he took away the continual ministration of Christ. His feeding the church with the bread. His interceding for the church. His giving the Holy Spirit to the church so it could shed light. The preaching that Jesus died once for all for the sins of the world. And by the way, the Roman Catholic Church also established the idea that, you know, you have to do penance in order, in order for your sins to be forgiven. So it wasn't enough for Jesus to die on the cross. You still have to do part of the payment yourself. Are you understanding what Daniel 8 is talking about? It's very serious. It has to do with salvation. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 12. It says, because of transgression, listen carefully, an army was given over to the little horn to oppose the daily. Word sacrifices shouldn't be there. What does that mean, an army was given to him? What did we talk about when we dealt with the feet of the image? What was joined together? Church and what? State. How did the church make sure that people, that people kept this system going that we talked about? The church couldn't do it as a church. They had to have an army. They had to have a political power to back them up. Is that exactly what happened during the Dark Ages? Did the church appeal to the arm of the state to punish anyone who was not in favor of their beliefs and their practices? All you have to do is read the history books. And so it says, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily, not the daily sacrifices, the daily. And he cast the truth down to the ground. And now notice, he did all of this and what? And prospered. Did the little horn prosper when it was persecuting the saints? Absolutely it prospered. Things went well. Was it necessary to perform a judgment in heaven to rectify things? You think? Absolutely. And we're going to be coming to that in a few moments. Now notice, it continues saying, and, and by the way, the, the word that is used here, prosper, is the same idea that is used in Daniel chapter 7 for the little horn. Now, when we get to this point of the vision, the video goes blank. And now Daniel can only hear the audio. Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. The video goes blank. Now he's not seeing, he's only hearing. He's hearing a conversation between two angels. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain holy one, certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be? That is the word shazon. Now let me ask you, what does the shazon include? It includes the whole vision, right? Does it include Medo-Persia? Does it include Greece? Does it include the first king of Greece, the four horns, the little horn in its first and second stages? That's the vision. That's the chazot. And so the question is, how long, a better translation would be, until when will the chazon be concerning the daily, eliminate the word sacrifices, not there, and the transgression of desolation, the given of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. You know, we have a similar scene to this in Revelation chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11. There you have some martyrs that are crying out from under the altar. This is the fifth seal. I wish we had time to speak about this. It's the same historical time frame. And they're crying out. And they're saying, because they've been mowed down by the church that claims to be the church of Jesus Christ, they're crying out, they're saying, Lord, until when? Same question. Will you not judge and avenge our blood on those 
who have shed our blood upon the earth. Now notice verse 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, literally it says in Hebrew, for 2,300 evening morning, in other words, units that are composed of evening and morning, in other words, days, the translation days is good, for 2,300 days, then what? Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now listen, there's a very interesting nuance here. Before Daniel 8 verse 14, the word that is used for sanctuary is the word mikdas. But in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, the word for sanctuary is changed. Instead of the word mikdas, it uses the word kodis. Interesting, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It's not the entire sanctuary that's been talked about. It must be something different because a different word is used. Are you understanding me? So the sanctuary to be cleansed is not the mikdas, the whole sanctuary structure. It is the kodesh, which must refer to the most holy place of the sanctuary. And we'll notice that a little bit later on. Now notice Daniel 8 verses 15 to 19. Then it happened. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, the shazom, and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. That word appearance is the same word that's translated vision. We're going to notice in verse uh, uh, 17, 16. Notice. So it says, I was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, what did he say? Gabriel, make this man understand the Marae. See, if you, were only if you only were reading in English, you wouldn't know that a different word is used for vision here. It's not the word Shazon. It's not referring to the whole vision. The, a different word is used, the word mare, which is the same word that is used here where it says, one appeared to me having the appearance of a man. The word appearance is mare. The word mare is used in connection with the 2,300 days, with that particular conversation between the two heavenly be beings. Verse 17, so he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and I fell on my face, but he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision, this is the Shazon, refers to the time of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the later time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. And then he goes on to explain the vision that we just looked at. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 20, very quickly. They have very little time. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are what? The kings of Media and Persia. Now comes the explanation. Verse 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of what? Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. Verse 22. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, for what? For kingdoms shall arise out of that nation but not with its power. In other words, they're not going to be descendants of Alexander the Great. Is he explaining the vision? Absolutely, the whole vision. Verse 23, And in the latter time of their kingdom, that is of the four, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, this is the little horn, by the way, having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. In other words, he's a crafty politician. Verse 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Why, why not by his own power? Where is he going to get his power from? What was given to him? An army was given him. In Daniel 7, who was it that helped him? The iron monarchy of Rome, the iron mixed with the clay. And so it says, 
In verse 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall what? Destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. We already saw that. He shall destroy the mighty and also what? Ah, there's the host explained. He was going to destroy what? The holy people. That's the stars that he was going to trample. Now comes the last part, which has to do with the prince of the host. Verse 25. Through his cunning, see, he's a shrewd politician, he shall cause deceit. He's going to use deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. Is he going to be a haughty power like the little horn who spoke blasphemies against the Most High and tried to occupy the place of the Most High? Absolutely. And notice, and he shall destroy many in their prosperity. And now notice the last part. He shall even rise against what? Against the prince of princes. That's the same as the prince of the host, right? Is he explaining every element of this, of this vision? Absolutely. And then he says, but he shall be broken without human hands. But there was one part that he did not explain. The one part he did not explain was the conversation between the two angels, the time period. He ends with the prince of princes. Let's notice verse 26. And the vision, this is the mare, the conversation of the two, the appearance, and the mare of the evenings and mornings. See, we know what the mare is. It has to do with the 2300 days, with the evenings and mornings. And the vision of the evenings and, mo of, and mornings was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. What was the only thing that was not explained in Daniel chapter 8? The 2300 day aspect. Do you know why? Because Daniel got sick. Notice verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. And now listen carefully. I was astonished by the vision, that is the mare, not the chazon. Had the chazon been explained? Yes. I was ast astonished at the mare, but no one what? No one understood it. What didn't he understand? He understood the Shazam because God told him through Gabriel, everything up to the prince of the host. But the only thing that was left unexplained was what? The time period, the 2300 days. Now the big question is, how can you know where the 2300 days end if you don't know where they begin? Daniel 8 doesn't tell us where they begin. Where would you expect to find in the Bible the place where, that would tell you where the 2300 days begin? How about the next chapter? We're going to notice in our next study that the next chapter tells us the exact date for the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary.